today's guest speaker has a lot to say, so I'm not going to take up too much time introducing her, but I did want to say that I heard about her first through my mom, who suggested I read her book. And my mom doesn't like to read, so I thought, wow, this must have been one heck of a book. <laughs> And I read the book, and what I realized was when someone who doesn't like to read tells you to read a book, you should, because it's a darn good book. All right, with that, let's give our guest speaker, Ingrid Radke Esbeto, a warm ARC welcome. My son just reminded me that is the closest I've ever stood to him. Don't sound so disappointed. I'm glad I never did before. Yes. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I, uh, I hope you'll be interested in the theme. It takes us basically from the early years of, of the Second World War. And I was five and a half years old when the war started. And I have lived many years trying to forget the screams, the smells, the horror, and the fear. Because when you lived through something like that, you never forget. And my age group, I was born in 34, so don't try and figure it out. I'm 83 years old. Uh, we were what was called the forgotten generation because we did not have any deep programming. We did not have any classes that would be kind to us and explain to us what happened. All we had was stand straight, salute the Fuhrer, and sit down and don't talk. And uh, I had just started school. And um, as you know, Hitler was born on April 20th in 1889. And he was born in Austria uh, with an eye on Germany for a long time. And he came, uh, he officially came to Germany in 1919. Uh, where he joined the National Workers' Party, which was later known as the Nazi Party. He was very ambitious and was involved in many groups. Uh, and in 1932, he was accepted to run for the German parliament. Now, the rules must have been much different then than what they are now but he knew how to manipulate people. In order to be able to run for that position, he had to be a German citizen. And um, he knew the interior minister of the NSDAP, who appointed him as an administrator for the state's delegation um, to the Reichstag in Berlin. It would be kind of like going from a small town in the state of California to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and on August 1934, we had a wonderful, wonderful president. His name was President Hindenburg. And uh, he was quite ill. And the previous day of his death, they decided, the cabinet decided that they were going to do away with the position of uh, President Hindenburg and uh, give it a new, a, new, a new layout of powers. And uh, Hitler all of a sudden became the chancellor. And as the chancellor, after Hindenburg died, he found himself to be the head of state as well as the head of government. Sounded like dirty politics to me, but having lived through the last few years in America, we've learned a little bit about dirty politics. 
and I'm not here to indoctrinate you. I'm just here to remind you that you are Americans, that you have children, that what I went through in Germany was cruel and beastly at times, and nobody cared. And I don't ever want this to happen in America. So anyway, he, uh, he eliminated, uh, Hitler eliminated the last legal remedy by which he could be removed from office uh, by combining those two offices. And in those days, nobody really cared about politics. Nobody paid any attention because it didn't fit into their lifestyle. They were a hard-working, clean-cut group of people. They liked everyone, and they, they worked. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves to exist under the leadership of this madman and his cabinet of equally twisted and uncaring minds. Sitting in a car, saluting thousands of young people. They weren't there on their own free will. Is that the young people? Yes. Yeah, they're on the other side. They weren't there by choice. They were ordered. I was raised in my household to take orders, but I was never used to having to take orders from anyone else. He ordered the kids to be there. And he also ordered the workers to be there. So we see him driving down the road in his car and look at the expressions on some of these workers. This guy does not like Hitler, it's quite obvious. And some of the others do, and he, right away he has made himself an obstacle of discussion. So uh, seemingly overnight, there were new rules for the citizens of Germany to obey. And it, it all happened so very, very fast. All newspapers were now censored. We were not allowed to listen to foreign radio stations anymore. And when you live in a country, on a continent, which is a small country and you're surrounded by other small countries, you like to listen to other people's radio stations too because you might like their music better. But that became outlawed. New regulations pertaining to everything. Education became rationalized. Rationalized. So we did not have a free school system anymore. No prayer allowed in school. And instructions came from the top that we were told not to listen to the parents, grandparents, or other trusted adults, but to listen only to our new youth leaders, and if we did not, there would be consequences. Um, religious freedom was almost gone. Health care became national health care. Consequently, the good doctors left the country. Free enterprise became, went into a decline. The Hitler Youth was enacted. We had 400 groups of young people in Germany, church, scouts, school, anywhere in our country. We had youth groups so they could get together and be constructive. Well, they were limited by one of Hitler's cabinet, Waldorf and Schirach. And all of a sudden, all we had was what he called the Hayat, the Hitler Youth. And as they got older, they even had to wear a uniform. Is that my little guy? Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm checking on, checking on him. Look at that. Isn't he cute? But you know what we're raising? We're raising Nazis. And we're giving them the illusion that they're going to be very, very important. And the older ones, 
were uh, greeted by Herr Führer, and they were even given the silver cross when they were brave enough to go into a, a flag tower and shoot down planes under the age of 16. In 1939, Hitler, who was not a seasoned or intelligent military leader, unyielding, driven by his enthusiasm, bungled an attack on Poland and without declaring war on their country. So this New York Times article informs America that Hitler had attacked Poland on September 1, 1939. And the attack, because it was totally unexpected, killed 1,200 people, adults and children. Consequently, Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3rd, 1939, and the bombing of the capital city started. And on December 11th, 1941, the U.S. also declared war on Germany. Germans are notorious for taking hikes on Sunday and sunny weekends, so as a special treat, my mother took me to our summer home, which was in the south of Berlin. And it was to be my last chance to visit there before we were forced, I'm saying again forced, we didn't ever have to improve anything. He did it for us. My beloved Dachshund and my best buddy were, was freezing, and I soon put her back in my warm night sack, so the walk had to be cut short. Fortunately, we made it home without an air attack. And at home, we cautiously stayed near our basement because since the beginning of the bombing, soldiers and few of the men that were left in our country and not in the field and we're reinforcing basements in uh, houses in Berlin and outside of Berlin to give us some protection from the bombings. And after the all clear alarm rang, we would go outside and we would check on our na neighbors and make sure that they were all right. Here we'll have some not so lucky people Several scared families were huddling for safety in the basement of an empty industrial building. Some of the lighter built houses took a lot more damage. And terrified children were hovering in front of their home, waiting for their families, hoping that they made it through the night all right and would come and take them to a safer place. And then there's a poor homeless woman with her dog and a few safe belongings with no place to go. We're beginning to see trains leave Berlin where some of the children that were lucky enough to have family in West Germany could board the train and get out of the city and away from the attacks. On the other side of the street, we saw pitiful, pitiful tracks of refugees arriving from eastern parts of Germany, transporting what was left of their meager belongings on a trip to nowhere. There was no place to go. And then, this is something that always grossed me out. It's a slide of, a desperate, of desperately starving people that had nothing to eat. And they were killing and carving, but well, they weren't killing it. It was already dead. God knows how long it had been laying there. Carving up meat from horses that had been killed by enemy fire. 1941 to 42, the bombing in Berlin became more severe, and the Nazis decided to evacuate the younger children to other parts of Germany. 
It was a sad day when my mother took me to the main railroad station in Berlin because this was the first time we were ever apart. And I was barely seven years old. I was leaving behind my mother, and I didn't want to. And I was also leaving behind a very small part of childhood that I never really had. Growing up under Hitler's Third Reich was a curse. He stole our childhood and our youth. After boarding the train, not wanting to leave, I remember pushing my way to the window of the train, which was slowly leaving Berlin. And I looked out of the window, and in those days, all the women were wearing the same kind of hat. So when you looked and you saw hundreds of women out there with the same hat, you couldn't really tell who anybody was. So I knew she was standing, waiting for me to wave bye-bye. And I did. I waved. I just waved. I could not make her out. But I had the good feeling that she thought I had seen her. And this was our last farewell. And then I sat down and cried. Hours later, when we arrived in a town by the name of Brussel in East Prussia, there again were many women at the station with handcards for our luggage. They just walked around and picked a child or two to their own liking. It was a strange and scary welcome. They did not want us, and it was so obvious. But you know, it was difficult for a family that hardly had enough food and hardly had enough room in their house to fit in kids from another part of Germany and make them part of their family. Of course, when you're a child, you don't look at it that way. You just feel sorry for yourself. Hitler didn't care. It was all for the good of the Third Reich. We spent 18 months in East Prussia, and sometimes under unbearable circumstances. Unbearable. And they are in my book. As the war was moving closer, the Germans were relocated, the kids were relocated to Saxony, which was another state in Germany closer to Berlin. And I don't know why they didn't send us there in the first place. And there I would look out of the window at night, and I would look at the sky, and it was red, and it would move. And it scared me, because I was sleeping upstairs in a little room all by myself. And I asked one of the boys, I said, what is that red glow in the sky? And he says, don't you know? That's Berlin. The enemies are burning it to the ground. And that's when I knew I had to get home. Somehow, I had to get home. And at the age of nine, I ran away from my foster home. And my family there. And what should have been a three-hour trip from where we were ended up to be a three-day trip. And I can't go into details because we don't have enough time. But I was terrified. And somehow I've always had a little bit of luck in my life. And I was standing at the railroad station and screaming my head off. I said, I want to go home. I want to go home. I've been here for three days. I want to go see my mother. She's dying in Berlin. And a German officer came to the window. And he says, what's the big problem? And I told him the same thing. And we were supposed to be very polite with the officers of the state. And I told him that I didn't like what they were doing to me. And he said, give me your suitcase. 
And I said, I will not give you my suitcase. You've taken everything from me. I'm not going to give you my suitcase. And some of the soldiers said, give him your suitcase. So I gave him my suitcase, and I gave him my knapsack. And then he leaned out of the window. And he said, come on, little girl. We're going to get you home. It was a kind of a fun trip, because the soldiers tried to make it easy on me. And then they tried to tell me how and teach me and train me inside of the, of the train how to get off a moving train. Well, you know, I didn't even realize what could happen. I just wanted to go home. So uh, they told me how to roll into a ball and then just just try to make it. And uh, when we got close to the destination in Berlin where I lived, they opened the window and two of the guys came over and one of them threw out my knapsack, the other one threw out my suitcase and then the other two took me and they threw me out of the moving train. I laid there for a long time, bleeding and hurting. And then I looked around and I hardly recognized any part of my old neighborhood. And I realized that where I had landed was hell in session. This grandpa, this grandpa is showing his grandson, what is left over of a night bombing. The night bombing took care in a part of Berlin that was bombed by mistake. This little boy is standing there, and to me, it, it breaks my heart because this is all that's left of his own. That's all he knew in his life and he's holding on to Grandpa's hand. And I can about imagine what went through his mind because I had the opportunity to have those thoughts. The picture to the left is one of Berlin's, or was one of Berlin's biggest gas emitter. And that bombing attack that night on Berlin was a mistaken target area. And the gas meter blew up. And the part of the picture that you can see of that night of devastation was over 120,000 people died. And blocks and blocks and blocks of apartments burned down. That was a bad night for Berlin. Returning to Berlin was like a page from a horror story. The constant bombing had caused thousands of displaced citizens, plus the refugees from Eastern Germany, to starve, freeze, and finally die in the endless rubble decorating the streets, lifeless and stiff resembling grotesque ice sculptures. And that is what you saw every morning when you went out on the street, if you dared to go on the street. In April 1945, the worst was yet to come. And if there are any Mongol descent citizens here, I beg your pardon. I do not wish to hurt your feelings. But the Russians had chosen a Mongol battalion and assigned them to ravish, and you can picture what that word means, all females from 8 through 80. Luckily, Mother and I had found refuge underneath a bombed out house. God watched over us. We never, never were assaulted. 
I have friends that were, most of them are alcoholics or hypochondriacs. They've never forgotten. You never forget. Like I said earlier, if you just think about it, you can smell it, you can hear it, you can feel it. It's dreadful. Next came the beginning of the occupation and starvation, need for water and warmth was almost unbearable. The fighting in parts of Berlin still continues and you can notice the white flags in the windows where people are still alive and giving up. The Stars and Stripes declared that Hitler and his new wife, Eva Brown, were dead by suicide and cremated on April the 30th, 1945. There's a lot of stories in the news that say, oh, he lived in Argentina and he lived to be 100 and he had children. Yeah, so did Elvis Presley. The red flag with a hammer and sickle was hoisted by the Russian army on the tallest building left standing in Berlin. Now, watches, liquor, women of all ages, and especially bicycles, were some of the biggest rewards the Soviets could confiscate, and they would fight relentlessly for each. They took home sinks and toilets even though there was no running water in Russian homes at that time. This poor woman, this poor woman could not defend herself, defend herself anymore. She had been violated continuously and was near death. And when I talk about violating, I'm not talking about one man to one woman. I talk 10 to 15 men and more to one woman until the, either the women were dead or they shut them out of pity. Another much younger victim is led away by a doctor and her mother. Western allies are beginning to move into the city. Oh, thank God. They had been prevented by the Soviet army to find quarters in their assigned sector. Then the Four Power Act was decided in Potsdam, and we heard with gratitude that the American army was assigned to be moving into our sector. Women were assigned to clean the rubble of the street. You have to, you can't picture it. Berlin was a beautiful city before the war. Huge buildings, lots of bricks. And when all that came down, there was nothing there. I mean, the outside still stood, but the inside didn't. And those women were assigned to, uh, to, to clean away the bridge. They took, oh, wait a minute. Sorry about that. They used uh, hammers or other tools to clean up the mortar from the bricks and stacked them in neat piles so they could be used for rebuilding. And my son, Robert, hi Robert, reminded me, I brought a piece of the Berlin Wall. You can come up later and put your hands on it and say, I touched the Berlin Wall. <laughs> this is the rubble of Berlin. There was no place to put it. We didn't have any room to put the rubble of Berlin. And these women cleaned it all up. And if you hold it up in the sunshine, in the light, you can see glass and porcelain and all kinds of things. And then there were some very important painters from the world that went and painted their creations on the Berlin Wall. And then when they broke it all up, I could be holding a fortune here and it was one of those big painters that painted it. But I'll put it on the table. Feel free to play with it. But you can't take it home. <laughs> the first signs of the black market, they were strictly forbidden. 
but people have found a way to use them. You always find a way to use them. Sometimes they actually traded their precious food stamps for whatever they could get. There was always fear of the disease to start and uh, may, might break out and it would have cold, killed a lot of people. So we had several injections that we had to endure throughout the months. And uh, I hated it because you know, you go to the doctor now, you give somebody a, a shot for their diabetes, it's just a little thing. But in those days, the needles weren't that long, and they were mounted metal, and they would bend, and they were horrible. And we had to do that every month, about four or five different kinds of this injection. Uh, the Berliners were seriously beginning to starve and freeze because there was no food in the stores. Because the, uh, you got your food coupons for getting your shots, but when you went to the store, there was no food. So people were, dying, uh, were just dying, plus the amount of refugees. Mother knew I was trading, but she was never brave enough to do it herself. Trading means you work the black market. You didn't get money. You traded your most favorite doll for one egg. But you traded it because you were hungry. She only cautioned me to never, never buy fresh meat on the black market because one never knew if it was man or beast because the black marketeers would cut up human meat and sell it on the black market. But, it's still, but I still seized and traded lead, copper, faucets, etc., from the ruins and the close-by neighborhoods. But then soon I found a new way to start more, a more pleasant and successful way to survive included, which included my mother. And uh, my dear friend and I talked on the way over here about the different businesses we have done in America. And that was my first business. <coughs> I went and acquainted myself with the U.S. veterans and nearby, in the nearby headquarters and GI kitchen. And mother and I helped in exchange for doing laundry and cleaning the rooms, we traded our services for raw potato peels. It's amazing how you can feed a whole family for days from just raw potato peels. The Americans always wash their potatoes before they, before they peel them. So when you took them home, you took home good stuff. Plus, you could make cornstarch or potato starch out of it. And uh, then there was the great use of the used coffee filters. You know, they had those big urns, and they had the big uh, filter in them. Well, I would go over there with my baby doll and bring home the coffee, and my mother would bake it in the oven. And then we made pretty bags, and then we sold it as fresh coffee on the black market. We were crooks, weren't we? <laughs> Sometimes we even got some peanut butter and jam and bread. And that was a feast. That was Christmas meal. That was the feast. I continued my trading with a very popular and needed material from bombed out houses. And, you know, you really could find a lot of treasures. You could do that now. You could go and sell it and get money for it. And American cigarettes were pure gold. One could trade anything for American cigarettes. If you had two American cigarettes, you could buy a two-pound of bread because that was the only currency on the market. Under the leadership of the U.S. and British, it was decided to have a currency friendly to the western occupied part of Berlin and West Germany, which was designed and printed 
in New York City and in Chicago. And from there, it was shipped to Germany and fairly distributed from the headquarters in the Frankfurt Bank. And it had been handled under the top secret code of the, by the name of Bird Dog. And General Clay, the very well-known general, was the leader and founder of this brainchild. Just think, German money printed in America, shipped to Germany, and then we spent it. Made in America. Wow. When the Americans and British occupation introduced the new German currency to Berlin and Western Germany, the Soviet regime went crazy. They cut off all the supply ways to Berlin that were open to us before. They cut off the uh, trains, the waterways, the railroads, including the only electric plant we had in Berlin, which was operated out of East Germany. So we now were existing on, if we were lucky, one hour of electricity a day. And uh, you couldn't get in and out of Berlin. But there was one thing that the Russians forgot. We had a lot, we were allowed to use an airway. And uh, that's how we uh, found out that our Four Power Act agreed upon in Potsdam now became the salvation of Berlin and caused the beginning of the Berlin airlift, also called the Russian blockade. The Berliners were standing in awe as the first American plane flew over Tempelhof Air Base and we could actually recognize the pilots in the planes. Sadly, the sacrifice of the American pilots was not without casualties. 32 of them died in this heroic event. All of a sudden, there was bread in the stores. We hadn't seen bread in the stores for, for months. But you had to watch out where you bought it because some bakers were still mixing the flour with sawdust. You don't ever want to eat flour mixed with sawdust. And here's one happy Berliner kid who had probably never tasted fresh milk in her life. That was amazing. This ground crew, mostly uh, German workers, had to work hard and fast to remove the supplies to make room for the next incoming plane. We loved all the planes and its brave pilots and appreciate the sacrifice of these courageous men that gave their all. One of the pilots actually walked over to the young people standing there and shared his few sticks of chewing gum with them, tearing it in small pieces. And they didn't know what to do with it because we didn't have chewing gum in Germany. <laughs> so they smelled it, and then he said, chew. And then they took the paper and took it home. I know the first piece of chewing gum paper I got from a regular student, and it cost me dearly to give up my, my sandwich to get just a wrapper of the weekly chewing gum. I kept it under my pillow for over a month, and it still smelled good. And you know, smell alone will satisfy you. Um, so he told the kids that how incredibly they behaved and that they did not beg him for candy or anything else. And then he promised them that he would be back and wiggle his wings when he landed so they would recognize his plane. And he kept his promise, for he soon managed to return in a beautiful 
Rosinenbaumer, that's what was called a Rosinenbaumer. It's a Berlin slang word, but it's a plane with food in it. And uh, while approaching the runway, he wiggled his wings, and it looks like he was dropping a loaf of small, a load of small parachutes. Small parachutes with candy on the bottom. He is a wonderful man. I know him dearly, and he, my son knows him dearly, and we're good friends. And all he could think of was those poor kids that had starved and suffered and been bombed, and what could he do for them? So he, uh, I have one laying up there. You can, you can take that too and look at it closely. And he wiggled his wings, and it looked like he was dropping this, this candy. And needless to say, the young people went crazy. Pilots ended up donating all their handkerchiefs and all their rations of candy to this effort all over Germany. And then when they ran out, the women in America heard about it. And uh, they sent cut material and twine by express plane for the pilots to make more parachutes with candy. And I have to give you, and that's why you see all that Hershey chocolate up there. Hershey chocolate donated 23,000 tons of chocolate to the Berlin effort to drop for the kids on the parachute. And once a week, when we got school soup, we were given a small bar of chocolate. I never ate mine. Most of the time, I had to give it to my father because he was working harder than I. But that's OK. I make up for it now. <laughs> Close up photo of a parachute with a hanky. See, it used to be a hanky. Then it turned out to be just Muslim and twine. And I'm sure your churches were part of this. We don't talk about it anymore. Here is our beloved candy bomber. OK. Colonel Gail Harrison with used to leave. When I ate and when I at the age of eleven saw him flying in I'm trouble with this one. Saw him flying in, wiggling his wings. To me, he never was a candy bar. To me he was a symbol of hope. He was my ambassador to freedom because he was the first person that did something for us with his heart out of pure love. Going on with the story, finally, glorious victory. The Russians had tried everything to stop the Berlin airport airlift. But it didn't work. Pilots, their crew, and ground personnel didn't quit. They had to rely on inadequate radar. There was one radar between Berlin and all the other stations in West Germany, and it wasn't working very well. Flew, so flew of them, some of them flew rust buckets that should not have been in the air, but trashed put up uh, with outside interference for their airspace, because the Russians would fly into the American airspace. Terrible weather. Up to five planes stacked in the airspace, so they could land quickly in Berlin and take off right away again. Too close to a different altitude 
too many tall apartment buildings too close to torn up runways. Should anyone miss their turn in line, it was back to Frankfurt. And with landings every three to five minutes apart, every hour, every day, every night, every week, and every month for a total of 11 months. That's hard duty to pull. And they didn't sleep in any hotels either. They went back to their airports and slept on cats in cold rooms and got up without breakfast. In Berlin, they would get a cup of hot coffee. Tough duty to pull. Those men were impossible, incredible. And in the end, the Russians got tired of waiting because they knew they were licked. This was always and will always be the greatest humanitarian effort accomplished. With the brilliant design by General Tanner and the effort of the courageous US military, British and other Western allies in the Berlin airlift to defy the unique air bridge and save 2.5 million Berliners and many, many refugees from freezing and starving to death. Now, I bore you with this for the last, but I think you need to know what they accomplished. In total, they had to bring in 1,534 tons of food per day. We need, that was needed to keep the over 2 million people alive. That is not including other necessaries like coal. In fact, the largest quality of it, anything required was coal. And in total, it was estimated that 3,475 tons of supplies would be needed daily. May God bless the men that lost their lives so valiantly doing their sacrifice for us. I th will thank them forever. And for you young people, I would like to read this because this was sent to me by the candy bumble who is now 98 years old. And I told him that I was going to be here today. And I could hear tears in his voice when he told me he didn't think he could make it. So he wrote me a letter, and it says, to the students of American River College, I give you my greetings and congratulations. Best wishes as you go forth to learn and serve I believe that you can studiously meet difficult challenges and that you may contribute to worthy causes. The world needs help, and you can do your part. You have proven yourselves as being worthy of your accomplishments thus far, but remember to be true to your personal values. As you leave home ground, there is only one exactly like you. I challenge you to continue preparing yourselves for the trials you will face you travel as you travel the road of life. You are at the starting gate. However, on the journey, always retain. Expand and look on things positive. By experience, I have found that some personal qualities that stood me in good stead are attitude, gratitude, and service before self, and there is a Father in heaven. It has been said, I have, I have forgotten the name of the author. He forgets things now that you can determine how you respond to 95% of the stimuli that you will encounter on your journey with planet Earth. 
The other 5%, the author said, God grant me the ability to accept the things I cannot change, the power to change the things I can, and the wisdom to tell the difference. My best wishes to you. Colonel Gil Halverson, retired, New Berlin Candyman. That is my talk. If we have time, questions? Anybody? Anything? Well, I'd just like to say that I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. I, I was fascinating. I, I lived with that book for several months. Uh, kind of like candy each evening. I could read a little bit each day so I could absorb it all. Thank uh, you. I, uh, my kitty didn't make it. I didn't, I didn't it. put it in the book, but my kitty was so hungry, and even the rats and the mice died. Yeah. And the cat found a pie of a neighbor on their windowsill, and she ate half of the pie, and the neighbors poisoned her. Aww. So my mogul died. Heidi, Heidi was my buddy. Heidi. She really was. Even if she ran away from me every time the silent, the, the alarm rang, and she was off to the basement before I ever got there. But uh, I loved her. Animals are wonderful. Sometimes more wonderful than people. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> um, when you were talking about the candy man, he was only 15 years older than you were, because he's 98, you're 83, so at the time you were... He was in his you, twin, in yeah. he, he started flying, his, uh, his grandparents had a plane, and his grandfather let him fly. And uh, so the first thing he did was sign up, and that's why there is such a short age difference. And I, I know he's thinking about you right now because he said he would set his watch and he would think about us and he would think about all of you and wishes you well. And he says, don't give up on the future. Our future will be all right. It's going to take the youth of this country to want it to be all right. We have a constitution in the United States that protects us from everything, but you have to read it, you have to learn it, and you have to make people stand up to it and do what it specifies. I bought and brought enough constitutions, there'll be more outside. You can all have one free copy of the constitutions. Learn it, learn it, learn it. It isn't just no guns. No, no free speech. It's a lot of other things. America is the greatest country in the world. Why do I have a picture of President Reagan? President Reagan was another one that ended up to be a friend of mine. I don't know why. God has a plan. Man thinks they have a plan. They don't have a plan. God has a plan. I work for President Reagan, sub-cabinet level with you as Senate confirmation for the elderly of our country for seven years, and then I worked for President Bush. And President Reagan was another one. That was just absolutely a fantastic person. I got to hold his father's Bible, and he told me, he says, Ingrid, I read my Bible, and you could tell because it had been so worn, I felt like giving him a new one. That's, sorry, the long cat story. <laughs> yes? Um, I want to thank you, first off, for your witnessing and sharing that with us. And it's helped me kind of close a page because my father took part in the Berlin Airlift as a pilot. And so now I understand what the other oh side Oh, my are. gosh. And I want to, this is a difficult question to ask, but do you, having grown up in this time, do you sense any of the darkness 
in our country that maybe is that was at work at, at, when you were young? May God strike me dead. I cannot lie. Yes, I do. And what do we do? Fight. Stick together. I don't care if I'm blue and you're red. I don't care if you're Jewish and you're Mormon. This is our country. We all own America. We need to learn to get along with each other. I have gone to Walmart and I saw a lady walk in and she was a black lady. And she had a very long face and I looked at her, I didn't know her from Adam. And I said, are you okay? She looked at me like, what do you want? And I said, you look very unhappy. She says, I'm very unhappy. I had a terrible day, but I have to work because I have to feed my kids. She says, and nobody cares. I said, I care. May I give you a hug? She says, oh God, would you please? And we stood there and we hugged. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. She looked at me and she says, there is a God. You just proved it to me. I said, don't ever forget. We are all one. Yes, we can fix this country because it hasn't gone too far, but we have to hold the idiots that we elect to office that took the oath for the United States to their word, and if they don't work, let's get rid of them. It's unforgivable what's happening in our country, and I'm not going to be political <laughs> because I'm not pushing anybody. I didn't have anybody's bumper sticker on my car this time because I didn't know who to vote for. But I think there is hope, yes. And if we talk to each other, and if we don't just keep criticizing like people do on Facebook, it's sickening. This is the best country in the world. I'm telling you, I don't care where you go, they don't have what we have. We even, <laughs> we even take care of our poor and needy. Yes. <laughs> well, we want to make sure we allow enough time I for know. books. I, I Ingrid know. has brought I a limited amount of books if anyone is interested in purchasing them. So we want to make sure we allow enough time the for books that. The books are good. They really are. And I didn't plagiarize. And <laughs> they, they tell what it was really like that I could not tell you. It was bad. And it will be bad here if we ignore it. Because if we can just talk to each other, it's not going to do any good. We have to talk to all of us. Everyone. I don't care who you are. Who cares who likes you? We like America. It's the best country. It gives us our livelihood. So is let's there, stick together. Is there one more question? Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make one quick comment. You were asking a little further about Gil Howerson. PBS did a documentary that talked about that whole process with the airlift and specifically about the candy bar. And I think it was on the front line, and I think it was Freedom. I, yeah, I watched it. Good, it was a good documentary. I watched it. Was that he still flies. He still flies. He went, this idiot. And I, I can call him that. He flew to Berlin last year to visit some friends. And somebody in Frankfurt found out he was in Berlin. So they brought him to Frankfurt. And he climbed this huge la ladder. And they told him everybody at school, the candy bomber is here. And he stood on that ladder for over an hour and threw candy over the wall <laughs> to the kids. He can't stop. He is, he is wonderful. He loves you all so much. He says, I live for our youth, and I live for the sense of our citizens that will realize that it can go back to the way it used to be. Thank you very much for bringing your story.
and candy.